Well, thank you. Um, so the topic of my lecture today is synaptic plasticity, which probably is uh, a topic which uh, will be um, <coughs> um, mentioned several times uh, this morning. What is synaptic plasticity? Um, this term describes the one second, <coughs> observation that uh, synaptic strength, say the strength of the signal which one neuron conveys uh, to the next neuron, is not constant like in the computer. In the computer, one transistor always sends the same signal, uh, 5 volts or TTL logic, uh, to the next thing. In the brain, it's different. Uh, uh, the synaptic strength changes during repetitive activity depending upon the use of the synapse. And neuroscientists are convinced that this plasticity is at the basis of many of the features of information processing in the central nervous system. Plasticity occurs on time scales of milliseconds to years, and it's um, mainly the long-term forms of plasticity which caught the interest of neuroscientists because it's helped to be the basis of learning and memory. The fact that uh, connections within our brain change with the information flow provide means uh, for learning and memory. And also, it has been found that psychiatric disorders uh, like addiction and others uh, are due to dysregulation of this synaptic plasticity. So, for those of you who have not yet had the privilege to uh, uh, get uh, 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 education training in neuroscience, let me shortly summarize what we are talking about, what uh, a synaptic transmission is. So, it's the fact that if a nerve impulse, when, when an action potential arrives at the nerve ending, uh, several things happen. Uh, a nerve causes the influx of calcium ions. Calcium ions cause the fusion of synaptic vesicles with the cell membrane. These vesicles contain the neurotransmitter, uh, which is glutamate in the case of a glutamatergic synapse, that's released into the synaptic cleft and uh, it causes the opening of ion channels uh, in the postsynaptic membrane. Um, okay, and the amazing thing is that all this can happen in a fraction of a millisecond. So, um, synaptic plasticity, as I explained, uh, enables experience-based learning and development. Uh, it also um, uh, 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 is a mechanism uh, to, re uh, uh, to brain injury, to repair brain injury, and it regulates on a short time scale attention and motivation. So the time scales of plasticity, as I mentioned already, uh, uh, goes over several orders of magnitude. There is a fast form of uh, facilitation, which is called pet pass facilitation, in the range of uh, tens and hundreds of milliseconds. There is short-term depression. There is uh, so-called frequency facilitation or augmentation on a somewhat longer time scale. Uh, there is uh, a form uh, which is called post-titanic potentiation, which is in the seconds to minutes range. And finally, the long-term plasticity over minutes and days, you know. Okay, so um, uh, the, um, uh, our knowledge about cis plasticity started with the discovery by Terry Lomo and Tom Bliss that you can increase the strength of a certain synapse in the uh, uh, hippocampus uh, by giving a, a strong high-frequency stimulus. So what they uh, observed is when they recorded the uh, feed potential in the hippocampus and stimulated the efferent nerves in a, with a low frequency, they saw a certain strength of the signal. When they then gave this strong stimulation, uh, it turned out that 
the signal was increased by uh, 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 many times, uh, it's decreased rapidly, uh, um, uh, reflecting uh, post titanic potentiation, but then there remained an increase over the basal level of the signal, which lasted over minutes. And this raised lots of attention because, uh, as I mentioned already, it uh, is believed to be the basis of learning and memory. Short-term plasticity, on the other hand, uh, happens in the time range of milliseconds to seconds. Uh, this is an example from the literature uh, about two synapses which converge on the same postsynaptic targets, the so-called Purkinje cell in the uh, cerebellum. There is, on the one hand, the climbing fiber input to this thing, which has typical um, depressing time course. So if after a long pause of silence, you start stimulating at high frequency, you see a big first response, which decays uh, to a lower level. Uh, another input, namely through the parallel fibers onto the same postsynaptic neuron, has exactly the opposite uh, uh, nature. It starts out uh, small and grows as you keep stimulation. So, uh, as it turns out, uh, the, each type of synapse has, uh, so to speak, its own personality with respect to plasticity. Now, let me shortly summarize um, the development over the years, uh, what happened, you know. Um, as just shown, in 1973, uh, uh, Bliss and Lomo uh, discovered this uh, LTP. Um, then in the 1980s and 90s, there were intensive, was an intensive and controversial debate on whether LTP, the potentiation, and the uh, uh, other form, long-term depression, are due to changes in neurotransmitter release. Do they change the presynaptic membrane in the sense that more neurotransmitter is released? Or else, is it a change in postsynaptic sensitivity, say in the number or so? Uh, uh, sensitivity of these uh, receptors in the postsynaptic membrane which sense the uh, transmitter. So there were many examples of different forms of LTP and LTP were found, some of them also described to presynaptic events, but the research focused on the so-called classical uh, LTP dependent on a specific form of glutamate receptors in the postulate membrane, the NMDA-dependent uh, receptor. Okay. Okay, so since the ninth, uh, 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 up to now, there were extensive findings on postsynaptic receptor trafficking, on the insertion and removal of postsynaptic receptors uh, from the membrane as a cause of these changes in uh, activity. And there was also translation of findings about these mechanisms uh, into therapies for addictive and compulsive uh, behavior. But I think, at least from my point of view, which is the presynaptic point of view, um, the presynaptic aspects have been somewhat neglected. Um, and uh, in particular, also the interplay between short and long-term plasticity has received little attention, although in a very early paper in 1996 by uh, Markram and Sodix, uh, a phenomenon was described called redistribution of synaptic efficacy, you know, um, which uh, uh, tells a lot about details or is an interesting phenomenon in terms of mechanisms of presynaptic changes uh, in release. I will get back to that in a moment. Uh, also, the fact that synapses are very heterogeneous, um, even if they are of the same type, the same type of connection, has received little attention until uh, recently. But I think it will be uh, um, uh, taken up again by uh, uh, Sultan Nusser's uh, talk later in the morning. Um, okay. Now, um, 
just an example of such heterogeneity at the synapse, which has been studied in my lab for many years now, the so-called Kedix of Health. This is a special synapse where you can simultaneously record both presynaptically and postsynaptically. Um, and if you stimulate that synapse with a high frequency train, whoops, um, uh, say like this, you find after some period of rest that there is a large response in the beginning and strong depression uh, over a time scale of uh, in the millisecond range. However, in another synapse of the same type, maybe the neighboring synapse, you uh, can see uh, quite a different response. You can see a relatively small first response growing and then going into depression. Um, and uh, what's plotted down here is just uh, the peak values of these signals that you can record in the postsynaptic membrane, plotted against stimulus number, and you see here the increase in size uh, and the decrease. And you can see here that there is just straight uh, uh, depression. Uh, the the uh, synaptic strength, the initial value of um, uh, uh, typically uh, um, uh, scatters over about an order of magnitude. So this is an old uh, um, example of an of a, uh, uh, earlier recording in 1996 from the Gewinner Laboratory in, in Switzerland, uh, which showed that um, Say so giving two stimuli uh, in fast succession, you have strong facilitation. But what this paper already pointed out was that if the uh, first response is small, you get a large facilitation, a big increase uh, uh, by 300%. You know, if however the first response is large, uh, uh, you get a small facilitation. So the the, the larger the initial response, the smaller the ratio between the second and the first. So this has been pointed out early, and it can be found uh, basically in all uh, glutamatergic synapses. This both this heterogeneity and the fact of the correlation between uh, 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 initial strength and pair path ratio. Uh, this is just a corresponding uh, uh, um, um, graph from our own public from our own synapse. You know, again, the pair pulse ratio plotted against uh, the first EPSC, and you can see a very strong uh, 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 dependence. Now, we were interested in what are uh, reasons, what are the mechanisms behind this heterogeneity and behind this effect, this interaction between plasticity and strengths, you know? And, um, well, uh, we were interested in that because uh, it's not as you might think that nature is not able to make synapses of a, of a, uh, uh, which, which are precise and uh, are the same all the time. No, the opposite is true. Um, uh, um, computational neuroscientists, people who uh, replicate connectivity in the brain uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the computer, they um, tell you that this heterogeneity actually expands the information processing of neuronal networks. And so it is very important to understand it. Okay. Yeah. So the other topic which I mentioned already is this phenomenon of redistribution of synaptic efficacy between neocortical neurons. And this was an observation by Henry Markram and Michal Zodix, who showed that when they induce this form of LTP in uh, uh, the cortex, they find a strong uh, LTP, a strong increase for single stimuli. However, uh, if they then look at the summed response over, say, five or 10 stimuli, um, they see that also the first, this is before induction of uh, uh, LTP, this is after induction of LTP, the first response is much larger, LTP, but uh, second, third, and fourth responses are smaller, 
in a way that the sum over all these things actually does not change. And this again is an interesting phenomenon which has um, received lots of, atten of attention in computational neuroscience, but little with respect to the underlying mechanisms, I think. Okay, so um, um, how do we study um, um, synaptic transmission, presynaptic aspects of uh, synaptic transmission? Um, there were two concepts, basically, uh, which have been um, put forward already in the very early work by Sir Bernard Katz, uh, namely the concept that there is a so-called readily releasable pool of vesicles, vesicles which are uh, uh, docked to special sites of the presynaptic membrane, and that when an action potential arrives, a certain fraction of this uh, um, 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 uh, readily releasable vesicles are released with a probability which we call here in my lecture P-fusion, the, uh, the probability uh, that uh, a vesicle fuses with the membrane. However, what has turned out in the last few years is that such vesicle pools are highly dynamic. And in fact, there is what you might call uh, Con converging evidence from different uh, technologies, namely electron microscopy, molecular biology, and also electrophysiology, that pools are dynamic. It's not a one-way street. It's not that the vesicle docks, waits until an action potential uh, uh, until it's released, but it probably, I mean, what I want to um, uh, explain is that it can go undergo several stages of docking and uh, uh, building up its molecular machinery for release, which can go both ways. So what is uh, th th there was a few years ago um, evidence from um, um, uh, uh, cryo uh, electron microscopy that uh, uh, more or less presented a kind of morphological equivalence to the docking process. What they could observe uh, is that uh, if they look at these vesicles in electron microscopy, there is a class of vesicles which is really tightly docked to the membrane. Um, but this happens only when the molecular machinery is intact. When they uh, study synapses from animals which lack a certain protein uh, called caps, they uh, do not see these tightly docked vesicles, but only vesicles which are, or mainly vesicles, which are a little bit uh, some nanometers away from the plasma membrane. So that um, paper showed that actually you need a number of synaptic proteins, particularly the protein MANC13, uh, in order to have morphological docking. Now, a few years later, um, in the laboratory of um, uh, uh, Christian Rosenmund, Shu Wen Cheng could show that um, uh, this docking actually is dynamic, also in the sense of uh, 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 morphology. Namely, that if she looks at the number of um, uh, these tightly docked vesicles in a time-resolved manner, she could show that after an action potential, there is actually an increase in the number of tightly docked vesicles. Uh, although you would expect, um, uh, if an action potential comes, releases a certain fraction of the vesicles, that you might have a decrease in the number of remaining docked vesicles. What she found is that there's actually an increase, but this is short-lived, it is labile. Uh, uh, if she waits a few hundred milliseconds after uh, an action potential, until she freezes the block and looks, uh, uh, fixes it and, and looks at, at uh, the morphology, she finds that these extra vesicles have been lost again. Um, there are several papers who meanwhile picked up this um, a, a phenomenon, and in particular, 
This publication by Kusig et al. from Watanabe's lab showed that this, what they call sync docking, a, a docking in synchrony with action potentials, um, um, uh, is happening also in wild type synapses. I have to uh, mention uh, that this study was done in, in uh, synapses with mutated um, uh, proteins in aptitagmine. But, but this publication then showed that it's a general phenomenon probably in glutamatergic synapses. Okay, uh, then uh, electrophysiological evidence. Uh, again, early evidence that this protein cups, which uh, I mentioned already uh, uh, two slides ago, is important for a uh, proper electrophysiological response. If uh, Jokush et al. looked at um, uh, synapses in mice, which were lacking of this protein uh, cups, they found a very small response, small in relation to what they would see with the normal, with a wild type animal. But surprisingly, if they then, I mean, this is when stimulating at low frequency, when they then applied a burst of high frequency stimulation, uh, they found that after that, for a short time, there was a very much increased uh, um, um, uh, EPSC response, you know, uh, comparable to what you see in the wild type animal. However, this increase was very transient in the sense that, I mean, this is on the time scale of seconds where this response is plotted. They found that uh, within about 10, 20 seconds, this uh, repaired response, so to speak, is lost. And they interpreted it in the sense that uh, this, what's called a priming process, the process of making a vesicle release ready is, um, is reversible. Similar conclusion was reached by, whoops, now, was reached by a, a study from the laboratory of uh, Matthijs Verhage in Amsterdam. And what they could show is that you actually need specific isoforms of proteins in order to um, uh, have a synapse which can maintain a, uh, at rest a high number of, uh, a proper number of docked and release ready vesicles. Okay. Um, finally, some evidence from molecular studies. This is from a study uh, from the laboratory of Jose Riso, um, uh, who developed an in vitro fusion assay, an assay where he can um, uh, uh, make in the dish a suspension of vesicles of different nature, which can fuse with each other or which can release its, uh, its, its content. And also with this purely molecular uh, assay, he came to the conclusion that you need a certain number, uh, a certain form of proteins, um, uh, uh, so-called priming proteins, like MANC18 and MANC13, but also a number of more uh, proteins of the right uh, type and uh, uh, with, with, a, with a proper function in order to uh, maintain a, uh, uh, to, to have a stable, um, a complex, a stable molecular machinery, which cannot be attacked by uh, certain toxins. Okay, so we then just tried to uh, implement this, these ideas in a simple model of uh, 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 priming and release, which assumes that you have a, a site to which a vessel can dock, and it does so first in a kind of loose form with, with an immature molecular machinery uh, 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 to cause fusion, which then can undergo a transition to a tight form, a mature form of priming, which then upon an arrival of an action potential can fuse with the plasma membrane and release its transmitter. So you can uh, formulate this kind of idea in the form of a um, st state model, 
as, as the same way as you describe chemical uh, uh, ch chemical reactions, uh, where you assign transition rate constants for the transition from the different states, uh, forward rate constants, which we have to assume calcium depend dependent on calcium, backward rates, which we can assume as constant, and then in this TS state, uh, TS standing for tightly docked, uh, 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 you get release uh, proportional to a, a, a probability of fusion, which is constant, of course, times the frequencies that you stimulate. So the important features of this model are that you have reversible priming, um, that uh, 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 reactions can go in both directions, forward and backwards, that only the final state TS can release, and that the forward rate constants are dependent on calcium. Okay, so we tried to fit a large set of data uh, with such, such a model, and surprisingly, it is quite easy to um, 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 get good, um, uh, good fits, good model responses. Once more, when you stimulate uh, this uh, synapse at 200 hertz, you have this strong depression. Uh, when you, in, in one type of synapse, in other type of synapse, or not type of, just in neighboring synapse, you, you have uh, these other forms of things. And we were interested in whether we can reproduce also this heterogeneity between synapses uh, by um, uh, or how do we have to change the model parameters in order to reproduce this uh, heterogeneity? Uh, so the data were such trains of um, uh, stimuli in with many frequencies, starting from half a hertz to 200 hertz. You know, uh, we plot um, amplitudes against stimulus number and get this typical behavior. Um, we can. This is plots against stimulus numbers. This is plots against time. Of course, when you when you when you stimulate at low frequencies at 0.5 hertz, hertz or one hertz, uh, uh, it is it is long on the time axis. Okay, um, but what I want to point out here already that strangely, uh, when you look at many frequencies, there is a range of frequencies between um, five hertz. Uh, 2, 5 hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz, where the steady state response is almost the same. This is surprising, since you would think that if uh, you double the frequency, uh, the steady state might be lower because it takes time to uh, undergo this priming process. Um, but what we found is that there is this kind of plateau region where the steady state of release seems not to depend actually on the uh, frequency of stimulation. Our approach of analysis is a little bit more complex than um, a standard technique. We apply one of the so-called blind source whoops, uh, blind source separation techniques, blind source decomposition techniques, namely called non-negative tensor factorization, to decompose release into two or more components which are common to all synapses, but vary in their contributions. We have the idea, I think, which uh, that, that um, uh, we can trim or we try to trim this technology so that it gives us back um, uh, components of release which represent the individual states of uh, the vesicles. Uh, so in the sense that um, uh, we uh, assume that uh, in a given synapse, the... the, the um, when we stimulate, the re release uh, can be decomposed into release which comes from vesicles which had been in this TS state at the onset of stimulation, plus a component of release which had been in the LS state uh, uh, before, before stimulation, uh, plus a component 
which comes from vesicles, which have to undergo the whole sequence of events. And using this technology, uh, we found solutions where we have uh, what we call base functions, the contributions from the different states of this form. Vesicles in the state TS, of course, are released rapidly. It takes only a few stimuli until all of those vesicles which had been in TS are released. Uh, there is another component which uh, does not release on the first stimulus because these vesicles have to first undergo the transition from LS to TS before they can release. Uh, but then um, uh, uh, the second, third, and fourth stimulus uh, releases many of these vesicles, but eventually they also uh, uh, die out, you know. And uh, finally, um, uh, in the end, you have vesicles which are uh, uh, all have undergone the whole sequence of events of uh, docking, going through LS and TS and releasing. Now, here down, down here you have two examples of two synapses which uh, are different with respect to short-term plasticity. One, a depressing synapse, which has a large component of um, uh, 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 TS vesicles, a medium-sized component of LS uh, vesicles, and uh, slowly rising vesicles uh, of this nature. In this synapse, which does show some facilitation, of course, you have the same time course of TS vesicles. However, you have a larger amplitude of uh, LS vesicles from this kind. You know? So we can explain the differences in the short-term uh, behavior um, by the assumption that um, all synapses uh, release basically similar during trains. However, the heterogeneity comes from the fact that at rest, before you start stimulation, the, um, uh, there are different contributions, different occupancies of these states. And um, as I, I said, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, I think it tells you, this kind of analysis tells you a lot of interesting things. So, um, particularly at low to mid frequencies, there seems to be a very simple uh, a, a picture, uh, namely in the sense that release probability does not change appreciably during stay trains. We find a release probability of about 40% uh, of TS vesicles. And this is the same as you start, uh, as you continue stimulation. Each time you release about 40% of the TS uh, vesicles. Also, what we can uh, see from other me measurements, from measurements of calcium concentration in the, in, 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 uh, in the terminal, that uh, this so-called calcium transiency, the increases in calcium which are elicited by a single action potential, uh, do not overlap because they decay fast enough so that within 50 milliseconds or so, basically uh, the calcium effect uh, has uh, decayed. And as I pointed out, there is this steady state release which changes only little with stimulation frequency in the 5 to 20 hertz. And these findings uh, suggest a very simple picture, namely that uh, single APs in this concentration range, uh, uh, frequency range, act autonomously. Each action potential releases a certain fraction of vesicles and it shifts a certain fraction from one state to the next one, you know. So everything happens um, per action potential. All relevant rates change linearly with stimulation frequency so that basically uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, you get the same type of response, the same type of changes um, uh, uh, for uh, no matter whether you um, uh, stimulate slowly with 5 hertz or with 20 hertz. However, this autonomous uh, autonomy holds only for stimu free stimulation frequencies smaller than 50 hertz or interstimulus intervals larger than 20 milliseconds. Um, once you uh, 
uh, start stimulating with higher frequencies, more than 20 hertz, 50 hertz, the, uh, um, um, uh, this simple uh, framework breaks down. N namely, um, the simple model does not consider that for higher frequencies, calcium domains, calcium signals overlap. There is a buildup of calcium in the nerve terminal during this high frequency stimulation. Uh, so far, the simple model does not consider the finding by cryo-EM that uh, a docking can be transient, you know, that is reversible within 100 milliseconds. Um, and we therefore had to extend the model for uh, uh, frequencies above 20 hertz by a so-called labile tight state, a tight state which is like the normal type, type states, which has a lifetime uh, in the seconds range, uh, but this labile tight state has a lifetime in the 100 millisecond range. And uh, also for saturation of the priming, we had to introduce a michaelis menten type saturation of the initial rate constant K1. So with these assumptions, uh, uh, we could nicely fit uh, uh, all the data, the whole frequency range. Uh, what you see here is over, uh, overlay of experimental data, the, the, the dots and uh, dashed curves, which are underlying. You hardly can see any difference. What you plotted down here is the so-called residuals, the difference between model a prediction and actual data. You can see that it's very small. Also for higher frequencies, uh, we can obtain very good fits. Uh, and now, well, what did we learn from that? We learned, as I mentioned already, that um, data are compatible with a relatively large fusion probability, which uh, is uh, the same for all the cells in the sample, for all the synapses in the sample. Um, we learned that heterogeneity um, mainly arises from different distributions of vesicles in uh, the, the, the different states uh, uh, at rest. We have learned that this transition from LS to TS is slow at rest, but it speeds up during activity in a calcium-dependent manner. Um, and um, um, uh, therefore, because the transition between LS and TS is so fast, the standard methods of me measuring the so-called radial release pool, the pool of vesicles which can be released, uh, reports uh, the sum of these uh, to uh, uh, populations. And so it reports a quantity, we think, which not only reflects the release process itself, but also the equilibrium between these different states of priming. Okay, uh, so just an example to how then within this model, uh, the heterogeneity between uh, synapse uh, comes about. What we did here is we, we just show, hold on one second, we just show um, uh, model predictions on the left, on, on, on the left column here, model predictions for a synapse where we trimmed these uh, rates, forward and backward rates, in a way that it contains ma mainly LS vesicles at rest, you know, it gives a large um, a, a per pulse ratio, a large facilitation followed by depression. In this column, we simulated, we show a simulation results of a synapse which has predominantly TS vesicles. You see that the uh, decay is very fast, you know, and if you then in the since these are model results, you can uh, plot how these uh, uh, components, the 200 hertz traces, which, which is this one, how this comes, comes about. You can see that it has uh, 
Uh, I mean, this is the sum to response. This is the TS component. This is the LS component. This is the component uh, 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 for, the, for the whole sequence. Um, um, uh, comparing this panel and that panel, you see that uh, uh, here you mainly have TS uh, vesicles. You have a small contributions of LS vesicles, which is large here, you know, and you have uh, uh, well, slowly rising uh, RS component in both things. Now, if you do this for several synapses, for several combinations of parameters, and again a plot the paired pulse ratio, the ratio of second to, to first uh, response versus the uh, amplitude of the initial response, you can reproduce this correlation between paired pulse ratio and initial response, which I showed in one of my first slides. So, um, um, let me summarize. I mean, what I think what we what we uh, could show at the Calyx of Held is that there is a that there is a uh, uh, a, a mechanism uh, which comes from the dynamic priming, which uh, very well can describe differences between the different synapses we have. We don't claim that this is the only way of uh, in which synapses are heterogeneous. I think in Soltanus's lecture later uh, this morning, you will see an alternative mechanism, namely um, uh, 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 which you may call nanotopography, the distribution between uh, the different components of the release machinery and calcium channels. The red th symbols here are calcium channels. They can be arranged uh, more spread out or more clustered. You know, I'm, I'm sure Sultan will show you examples of that. Uh, and of course, what I did not talk about is that um, also on the post synapse, you are likely to have a large heterogeneity in with respect to post synaptic uh, sensitivity and receptor trafficking. So, um, conclusions we establish a framework for analysis of STP, which does include the heterogeneity uh, between synapses, which does not treat uh, just uh, um, uh, average responses uh, from many synapses. Um, the model assumes uh, calcium-dependent forward priming steps, uh, probably regulated by the so-called the protein MANC13, a protein which is known as a priming processes. I didn't talk about molecules, but uh, this MANC13 has modulatory domains, so-called C1 domains, which respond to second messenger diacylglycerol, uh, and uh, C2 domains, which respond to change in calcium uh, uh, concentration. The model predicts that each action potential triggers a fusion of 40% of those vesicles which are actually fusion competent, you know, and it causes shifts between the states uh, during each action potential. About 8% of uh, LS vesicles are shifted to TS ones, and um, uh, a similar proportion is sh shifted in the very first step. You know, at higher frequencies there are additional features, um, and uh, the main point which I wanted to make is that heterogeneity between synapses is explained as a consequence of different occupancy of states. Um, likewise, uh, I didn't show this, but it's easy to, to um, uh, uh, um, um, replicate this phenomenon of free distribution of synaptic e e efficacy uh, as a consequence of change in the initial distribution. And um, the important thing is that we can uh, readily explain this uh, redistribution not as a change in release probability, but again as a change in the priming dynamics. Okay, so before closing, I should 
uh, acknowledge that all the data were, uh, which I showed were obtained by Kun Han Lin and the whole concept, all the analysis was done together with Holger Taschenberger. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And uh, I guess we have, if we have questions, Erwin is going to answer. Uh, I have a brief question. Uh, is there a correlation between uh, how smart someone is and how sensitive or fast the synaptic signaling is? <laughs> you would, you would guess. I mean, that's what uh, computational neuroscientists tell you that. Uh, the heterogeneity, the fact that not all lines of communication are the same, but are different with different uh, plasticity, with different strengths, it enhances the computational uh, capability, you know? I mean, this is not easy to understand. I think it's a, it's a consequence of computer modeling, you know, and, and theoretical considerations. But, but may, maybe, Maybe it also can be understood intuitively, you know, in the way that, say, if in the auditory nerve you have uh, parallel lines of, of uh, information traffic, if all the uh, uh, lines then create the same time pattern of changes um, in the next stage, you know, you probably have less possibility to distinguish or to, to reconstruct the timing of an input to the whole network, you know. Uh, if individual lines have different temporal properties, you can, and you, and, and the next stage of computation knows, that, uh, has learned uh, uh, about this difference in the, in the dynamics, then you, 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 you can transfer more information, you know? So before the next question, may I ask you, Erwin, that here we've heard about uh, synapses, which is in the auditory brainstem, and obviously the mental capacity is probably more uh, associated with the neocortex. So do you predict then that in neocortical synapses, this heterogeneity, what you just described here in the auditory brainstem, is going to be larger? Why should it be larger? Because probably the cortex should uh, be primed to more diverse functions or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> I mean, actually, we have never studied things on a higher level, you know, um, but, but I think a, I mean, what we typically see is a tenfold range in synaptic strength, you know, um, probably if you allow even higher ranges that at least on the low end, things are lost in, in, in noise, you see. So I have a question about the transition between this low state and the tight state. Yeah. So I was wondering, if, is it primarily due to the conformational change of factors that are there in low states, or are there new factors? Uh, well, as I uh, try to indicate this, that we think that mainly monk 13 protein, which is a large protein, a kind of scaffold, you know, which also is helped to uh, uh, be part of the initial contact between the vesicle and the plasma membrane, that this protein was shown that it can be in different conformational states, you know, and the different conformational states are regulated by modulatory domains in the protein. I mentioned there are C1 domains, there are uh, uh, C2 domains, and then depending on the occupancy of these states, uh, uh, the protein can be in different conformations. And I mean, we have to recognize that uh, 
This protein doesn't act individually uh, alone. It is part of a big complex. You know, maybe a, 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 a kind of kind of kind of nucleus also for this complex. So the our the idea is that uh, all these proteins, including synaptotagmins, snare proteins, complexin, uh, TOC, uh, 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 quite a number of proteins which are believed to form this complex. They all can um, be in uh, or contribute to the energies of the different conformations, and um, that, but that one of the dominating factors uh, are these um, regulatory domains on MANG13. Again, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So you showed very large heterogeneity from calyx to calyx. So, you know, one postsynaptic cell receives input from one calyx. Mm -hmm. So these are between cells. So do you have a hint of how uniform the different distribution of these different states between the active zones within a single calyx? So there are about 500 active zones yeah, or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And many release sites within those. Mm -hmm. Because in your model, for one calyx, you are using one state distribution. Yes, yes. Uh, well, unfortunately, we cannot um, measure uh, responses of individual active zones. We do postsynaptic whole cell recording, which means, as you pointed out, that we get the average response of some 500 uh, so-called uh, um, uh, 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 release sites, you know, and um, of course there may be differences, heterogeneity also between these individual release sites, but we average all these, and uh, I think this will be different in your presentation, where you actually have a small number of, re um, uh, of release sites. Um, so, we we um, uh, compare different synapses, and we think that the um, uh, uh, heterogeneity that we see after averaging over all of these mainly results from the biochemical state, so to speak, of these um, uh, 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 of this calyx structure. I mean, the um, I mentioned C1 domains, which uh, respond to the second messenger diacylglycerol and uh, the uh, uh, phosphorylated lipids, the, the um, uh, phosphinositol lipids, you know. So probably the heterogeneity is mainly um, due to, say, different concentrations of PIP2 in the membrane. No, um, uh, which which then we would have to postulate uh, is a property of all the 500 active zones. Uh, I'm aware of one study which showed that a um, mutation in MANG13 in a given patient, a spontaneous mutation, I think, uh, caused a number of neurological deficits. You know, and the mutation uh, is at a site in MANG13, which is likely to influence the distribution between the two docking states. But but I'm I'm aware of only one publication which uh, uh, um, uh, goes into this issue, and uh, it may be due to the fact, which I pointed out in the beginning, that presynaptic aspects. Uh, of plasticity have been studied much less than postsynaptic ones, you know. And of course, on the postsynaptic side, you have many studies which uh, associate um, disorders such as uh, addiction, uh, compulsive behavior, with um, deficits or, or changes in the receptor trafficking in the distribution of different subtypes of postsynaptic receptors. So if there is no more question, we would like to thank you very much for your presentation. And as usual, I would like to ask the chairman of the curatorial board as well to come up and we would like to deliver the certificate uh, for your presentation and the, and the medal.